It's a great pleasure to welcome Richard Hamilton. And um, actually, as this marathon is the London Marathon, and we are somehow trying to um, map different aspects of the city, I wanted to start, actually, and it will not be the only question, we'll ask you also about many other things, but I wanted to start with some questions about London. I wanted to know why you actually did leave London in the 70s, and if London is still a source of inspiration for you now. I've been asked the question before, occasionally, <laughs> and I was surprised to find that when I left London, when I made the decision, which was in 1970, something or other, and I was confronted by Bill Turnbull one day, who said, what's this betrayal that you're indulging in now? You're supposed to be this urban figure, sort of prophet of urbanization, and you're going to live in the country. And I said, well, I had to find an explanation, so I'm ready for you. <laughs> and the, the reason was that I felt that there wasn't really that much difference between being uh, an hour out of London and, and, and being in Highgate. Uh, it took me an hour to get to centre London when I was in Highgate, and it takes me an hour to get into London now that I'm in, in between London and Oxford, <laughs> the other side of High Wycombe. So, uh, the, the main reason, I suppose, that I made the decision was that I needed more space. I had been living in the same place for 25 years or so, and then uh, it became obvious that it would be good to have a bit more studio space, working space. And to my horror, I found that it was extremely expensive. Uh, every time I uh, found something that seemed to make sense, like Romney's studio in Hampstead, which was a bit ambitious, I suppose, but any, it was, it was uh, available in, in a sense. So I thought, that this would be worthwhile to do that. But the, the costs reached the stage. It, they were up, up uh, grading the value of the thing every few months. So I was finally told by my accountant, forget it. You could live in the Isle of Man. That would be a tax advantage. Or you could live in Jersey. But don't worry about Hampstead. And so I thought that they didn't appeal to me very much. I'd much rather <laughs> stick around. And the now is just the right time, I think, to be out of the center of London. And I have friends. Marcel Duchamp's wife, Tini, moved an hour from Paris. That perf was perfect. Uh, and I found that Jasper Johns was living an hour from New York, up at Stony Point. So. That is a very interesting new statistic for our <laughs> list. <laughs> no, no way. And to my astonishment, I found that there were great advantages. Not only do I have more land, I have 18 acres now, and lots of farm outbuildings that I've converted to exactly what I, I need for my working purposes. So it's a pretty good situation. But the astonishing thing is that facilities are more widely available in uh, High Wycombe or Reading or Marlow even. My wife, Rita, whom I love, took me yesterday to uh, get a problem of neon solved. And it's difficult, I think, to get uh, neon. It's not a, a, a medium favored by artists these days. So, we, we searched around, she searched around on the, on the internet and found that there was a place in Marlow, which is about 20 minutes drive or 15 minutes even. And he was fantastically good, the man that we visited there. A real craftsman, not a, not a, a tradesman anyway that I expected. And he'd worked with his father when they had a big... Uh, not a big company, but at least uh, 10, I think he said there were 10 people working, blowing the, this neon. 
If I want some, some computer part, I can always get it more easily there, and the internet, I have fans calling every day, really. I think it is literally every day, feeding me with stuff. I don't even have to go to Henley to buy it, or Oxford, as I thought I would have to in the beginning. So there's not really much difference. And except that there are tremendous advantages to being in the country and it's hell when you come into London. And do you feel that London has changed its identity into a more global city? Do you feel that there is a strong change? It's become less pleasant than it was. <laughs> If that means more global, <laughs> I'll accept it. Maybe another question, um, and I think Ren probably will then continue, I thought, just at the beginning maybe about architecture. We've had a lot of um, discussions here about art and architecture and um, actually um, it was mostly actually about a dialogue, it was mostly about collaboration. So we are very interested in a kind of a maybe also conflict which can exist or maybe um, collision. And um, I remember in a couple of years ago that you were very, very upset about certain aspects of the Venturi building. Uh, in London, and oh. I thought that it could be interesting to talk about this, uh, uh, knowing that it's a sort of whole I wasn't, I wasn't link. upset by the Venturi building, I rather admire it in a way. I think it's very peculiar, that's yeah. all. And it's an interesting question for me because uh, I went to the States, I suppose in the 70s sometime, and I was sitting next to somebody just before dinner at Yale a very academic kind of evening, and this person said, how does it feel to be uh, one of the fathers of postmodernism?" I didn't know what postmodernism was. <laughs> I thought it's not very sensible not to be acquainted with your children. So postmodernism was something that uh, I, was, I felt I was being blamed for in a way when I, when I knew what it was. And I, and I thought it was a very peculiar Uh, name. It's not like cubism or futurism, you know what that stands for, but postmodernism, it sounds a bit like post contemporary. It's a bit of a conflict of terms. But I'm certainly conscious of the fact that I'm interested in design and I've always been friendly with architects and admired what they did and found them more pleasant to converse with <laughs> than most of my painterly friends. <laughs> so I, I did feel that there was something odd in my uh, interests in that I wanted to find out why uh, product designers like Dieter Rams should be something that moved me so much. <laughs> Should, we, should have that talent. Uh, and was it more interesting than a hamburger? So there were all these things going around in my mind. And what was pop art? Was it about uh, vulgar things exclusively? Or could it introduce something more high style? And it, it became... Uh, a problem for me in the sense that on the one hand I was doing fairly figurative things and on the other hand I was trying to do something that I thought of as a product. And these products became very close to uh, even a table. I thought, well, there's as much, I've, I've given this as much of my uh, facilities and, 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 and mental capacity that I, that I would give to a painting. So. Is it a work of art? How do these things relate? I think I'm talking too much. That's great. Right. No, no. <laughs> you will have a go. Um, you, the, the, the first time I knew about you uh, and, and saw your work was in, in connection with the Smithsons, and it was particularly one collage uh, with a kind of bodybuilder that, that was your, established your connection to architecture. Um, What, to what extent were you an ally in, in and, and to what extent did you have a kind of collective aim with them? 
I, I think we had rather uh, opposed aims. And when I look at the 1956 exhibition that you're referring to, and I, I think of the uh, so-called fun house that I did with John Volker and John McHale, and, and, and compare it with Smithson, Eduardo Palazzi, and uh, Nigel Henderson, all, all friends of mine, and I think, why is there so, well, why is, is what they did so archaic? So, what, so. Archaic, I mean, it, it was almost, almost uh, primitive. It was, the idea was, I will make a fence because that separates territory and you put a shed in it. That was architecture. You defined your space and you put a shed in it. And then Eduardo filled it with sort of pseudo fossils. And I thought, what is the po <laughs> how, how far back can you go to be modern? <laughs> and then I remember my own contribution, which was very uh, futuristic. The interesting thing about this was that I was um, not at the meeting when a decision was made to call it, this is tomorrow. If I'd been there, I might have argued but I was in, working in Newcastle, so I didn't attend all the meetings that were going on. And when I came back from Newcastle one weekend and, and heard that it was, this is tomorrow, I thought, how can we, how can we do anything about tomorrow? Uh, let's, let's at least find out what's going on today. And so my whole concern was about today. Uh, and yet, the other people in, in the so-called group, <laughs> were doing things that were rather passe, to my way of thinking. <laughs> but they, they went up to, the, to today even. How, why, why should we claim to um, be establishing something to do with tomorrow? I, I, I totally recognize this, this kind of absurdity of architecture, uh, that it's always claiming, excluding, defining, and therefore closing. Uh, do you think that's inevitable or, or not necessarily? Um, I don't think it's necessary, really, because I've always been interested in something wider, to be interested in architecture, and even in, within the area of art that I've chosen, paint, that is to say painting, it's a pretty wide range of objects and not only objects but also subject matter. In fact my interest has been really to look at it as subject matter and the, the, the right uh, pictorial solution to that particular subject and choice of subject. And I, I began to feel that what was needed was a kind of general a theory of general relativity. You're looking for something which will tie everything together rather than uh, open it up. Well, if that isn't too ambitious. Yeah. <laughs> what you just said that uh, more about the present than about the future. Still, I wanted to ask you about the future. I had emailed you about that earlier, and we had an email exchange. I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about the future. At the age of 84, I think it is, it's hardly any point in talking about the future. My future is somewhat limited. <laughs> My friends are dying like flies around me. John Latham last week, Marcel Brodhaus, Dieter Roach. I feel uh, somewhat alone. And the, the pictures that I'm now engaged in, the paintings, which are, when I, when I began to assemble the, the, the group of things that I wanted to do and work towards a, a completion of it as a, a thing that I would, like, I would like to be thought of as the late paintings. <laughs> and. It, they're really rather absurd and, and uh, re uh, retro rather than a sort of late final statement. 
and I have become enormously interested in the idea of beauty. I'm painting these creatures that I call angels, uh, which are inspired by Fra Angelico <laughs> as much as anyone. And they are, they're all angels that are stripped off. I know that they shouldn't be girls, but they are, they're, because I'm more interested in painting girls than in painting young men. And I find that I get so much pleasure from doing this. They're, they're completely self-indulgent. I'm past any, any thought of, of uh, sex. They're not the slightest bit erotic. They are simply beautiful. And I, I, uh, I, I know that they're absurd as a group of things. But when people look at them, when people come to my studio, they think there's something going on here <laughs> that's new. <laughs> Very much for this beautiful I have one more question. Yeah. May yeah. I? Can I have one more question? Actually, because I thought it was very beautiful that you mentioned John Latham. And um, when we spoke with Eric Hobsbawm uh, preparing this marathon, um, he said we should not forget about memory because he sort of wants to protest against forgetting. And um, I would be very, very happy if you can tell us a little bit about John Latham because I remember somehow that at a certain moment not that many people could sort of cope with the complexity of John Latham's work, but John Latham always told me that you are one of the very few only people in the world who somehow understands him. So I think it would be wonderful to hear a little bit about John. Well, of course I've known John for 60 years, is it? 50s. And I've always been excited by what he did. I would go to a uh, something going on in a cellar in Better Books, I think it was. And it was a machine that blew paper all over the room, tore up paper and blew it all over the room. And, and this was so extraordinary to see going on. I, I think it must be either late 50s or early 60s. And everything he's ever done has been exciting in that way. But it's very hard to find out why and what's going on. And I get all these wonderful documents over the years. There was a fantastic exhibition at the Arts, uh, at the Hayward Gallery. Arts Council did it. And, and, and he produced his own catalogue, which was a fairly big, about A4. And it was an accounting. Thing. It was like a, a company annual report. And several pages, well, there was nothing on anything except pages, columns of figures. Except they weren't figures, they were zeros. Everything was zeros in the form of, of, of a sort of company statement of, 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 of accounts. And I thought this was so good. The only thing that I think can compare with it is a, a Marcel Broadhouse production who did a... Uh, um, um, the Malame. Uh, uh, he, he made a reprint of the Malame, and instead of putting the lines of poetry, he put black lines of the same length as the poem, the constellations. And I think that John's piece somehow measured up to that <laughs> in my mind. Uh, but as the years went by, and I, he very often asked me to attend meetings, and I couldn't figure out what the hell he was talking about, and nobody else could. <laughs> and finally, uh, we, we got down to the nitty-gritty in that I had, to, I had to really figure out what was happening. And it, uh, it occurred because Hans-Jörg Meyer wanted to, do, uh, was being asked by John, actually, to do a book. And he kept getting away from it, because he says, everybody has so much trouble with John, it's just not worth getting involved in that kind of difficulty. I've got better things to do. And I said, but hans you should persevere. You should do it. Because John is, is worth it. He will do something wonderful, I know. <laughs> and 
So the book was undertaken. And it was a wonderful book. It's called Voyage of a Surveyor or something, or I've forgotten the title. But it's a great little book. And of course, he started to say, nobody's reviewed it. And he rang me up every week and said, would, would you do a, a review of it? And I said, well, I, I, I don't write reviews of books if I can help it. But he said, I can get it published. The Observer will do it. So just, just try it. So I, uh, I worked for a couple of weeks and I got a paragraph. And then uh, he would ring me up and, and say, what have you done? And I told him I'd done a paragraph. Could I see it? <laughs> I sent him the paragraph. And as things went by, it took eight months, nine, eight or nine months to do, with him ringing me, persisting, do it, do it. And I didn't talk to him about it at all. I just submitted to this great pressure <laughs> until finally the thing was done. At times, uh, when I sent him pieces, because he always insisted on every paragraph coming to him as soon as it was finished. And he, he got a bit worried because he thought I was being flippant. And he, he really uh, was feeling uncomfortable. But I just carried on and, and got to the end. And finally, it, I don't think the Observer had ever shown any interest in publishing it, but it was a way to get me moving. <laughs> and it, finally, I think it was published in, uh, when, it, when he had a, an exhibition at Nicholas Logsdale. So uh, I think I do know something about John, because he says, this is the best thing that was ever written about me. <laughs> but I don't really understand him, or in a way understand myself. But I was able to produce a text, which I thought had uh, some value in that it summed up for me what John meant. And it was uh, a labor of love, I must say. <laughs> Many, many thanks, Mr. Thompson. I'm sorry, it's taken a long time to do that.